Have you ever felt trapped, helpless? What if you woke up in an empty room with no one else there? As Rick Grimes from The Walking Dead first found himself in a hospital room, alone, with the dead outside, you would be unsure of who or what was outside, but knowing that your world had changed completely. How about if that world had collapsed entirely around you, leaving you in an end of the world scenario where you must fend for yourself? Imagine the technology that surrounds us simply going away one day. What would happen? How would people react? Our world faces dangers that could end human civilization at any time. These range from the currently uncontrollable, such as an asteroid strike or a solar flare, to the artificial, such as nuclear war. While the possibility of these kinds of catastrophes are always present, they can be mitigated, eventually. But within all of us, there will always be a fear that someday the world might end. This has led to genres of science fiction, such as dystopian sci-fi, but also horror, both imagined and possible. But because of our psychology, a mix of fears can be achieved that while not plausible, is certainly scary in a resonant way. One such case would be a zombie apocalypse like The Walking Dead. But the science here is psychology. Why do we fear zombies? What is it about the reanimation of dead flesh that has unsettled us ever since Mary Shelley penned Frankenstein two centuries ago? I explored the psychology of that with my guest. What is the psychology of the end of the world? You have fallen into Event Horizon with John Michael Godier. Today's episode, John's guest is Dr. Travis Langley. Dr. Langley received his BA in psychology from Hendricks College and his MS and PhD in psychology from Tulane University. A distinguished professor of psychology at Henderson State University, he teaches on crime, social behavior, mental illness, and media, including courses titled Batman, and Psych of the Living Dead. In 2015, Dr. Langley authored The Walking Dead Psychology, Psych of the Living Dead, and Star Wars Psychology, Dark Side of the Mind. His previous works include Batman and Psychology, A Dark and Stormy Night, and numerous other psychology-based books on sci-fi, and comic titles such as Game of Thrones, Doctor Who, and Star Trek. You can find him on Twitter at Superheroologist, where he ranks among the 10 most popular psychologists with over 100,000 followers. Dr. Langley, welcome to the program. Oh, thank you for having me. Doctor, now, usually on this channel, I'm, I'm usually interviewing people about things like astronomy, astrophysics, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence, things like that. But I thought it'd be interesting to do something a little bit different. You are a psychologist. And one of the things you look at is pop culture, but also the psychology of um, science fiction and and the, the characters. What led you down that path to look into that as a psychologist? Oh, gosh. Um... <laughs> There are a lot of different things. I mean, it used to be the psychology side of my life, and the part interested in writing about popular culture were two different things in terms of looking at specific kinds of fiction, like The Walking Dead and all that. But even back in my graduate studies, I was studying how people cognitively process films that they're watching. So that interest has always been there to some degree for me. But it was 2007 when I was reading a book by Danny Fingeroth, Superman on the Couch, where he's talking about how we respond specifically to superhero stories. And I was thinking, I want to write this kind of book, but as a psychologist. And I attended San Diego Comic-Con for the first time. And at San Diego Comic-Con and WonderCon, there's what's called the Comics Arts Conference. It's a scholarly conference within the convention. And in San Diego, they have 20 hours of programming. So it's scholars talking about different kinds of work and there was one in particular neil Cohn, who he talked about fmri data 
he had from people reading comics, which he'd paired with survey information. I was thinking, this is a, an intriguing model. And for people who, but for a lot of people, it sounds pretty frivolous to want to study popular culture. My thought is that something that generates billions of dollars and inspires people all over the planet, that seems like something more worth studying because of its impact. In terms of what I do within these books that I've been working on, we're largely looking at the psychology of the characters and stories as a way of talking about real psychology. So a lot of it is fairly pedagogical, you know, using it to teach psychology as a form of teaching some of the things we know about real human nature, but through these fictional examples. Right. And one of your books particularly piqued my interest because I'm a fan of The Walking Dead. Um, this book, uh, Psych of the Living Dead, The Walking Dead Psychology. In this, um, the contributors delve into the psychology of the characters of The Walking Dead. But before we get to that, um, I've, I've always been interested in zombies as a science fiction author, but I'm a hard science fiction author, so it's very difficult to imagine a way that a zombie could be. It's just a trope within sci-fi that, even though it's very, very old, goes all the way back to Mary Shelley and Frankenstein, this concept of reanimated dead flesh. There's just very few ways where that could be scientifically plausible in the framework of a, of a science fiction story. But I also see it as a euphemism for the end of the world, an end of the world scenario. Do you think that's valid? Do you think people are interested so interested in the zombie genre specifically because it explores the idea of what happens when the lights shut off and you're on your own is it that is there a primal fear of that and is that what zombies represent zombies pull together a, a number of primal fears one is just the end of everything but also the loss of our own humanity you know these are cre these are things that were human that were human beings and no longer are that is one of the most ancient things you can find in any story in the world, fear of ghosts, spirits, you know, z vampires, z zombies, you know, even long before they became, you know, before they took more of the modern form of what we think about them, you know, there are ancient vampire stories, just different kinds of vampires. You know, something that used to be a living human being and is now coming back and it may not be the person it used to be. In terms of what does this have to do with real life, we fear losing our own humanity. People fear losing it to senility. People fear lo losing it to circumstances. And these zombie stories that have become so popular in recent years become a way of looking at this fear of losing our own humanity. In The Walking Dead, especially a couple of seasons before they wind up in Alexandria, they were repeatedly talking about, you know, how do you hang on to your humanity in a horrible, horrible world? In the real world, you can look at the most horrible places on earth. How does someone survive in Burma, or the land formerly known as Burma, in a terrible situation when you know government is corrupt and they and they have very few resources? How do you manage to? be a good person in these environments. So we have real world circumstances. We have fears in our own lives. It was like people could be afraid of what happens if you become senile? What happens if you are drunk and lose control? What happens if you get a head injury that alters who you are? These things concern us. And so that fear of losing humanity, it is, a, a, it is real, but it is not fun. You don't see, um, you don't see a lot of fiction about people going senile unless it's meant to be, you know, very sad drama. You're not going to have a fun adventure with something that's causing people to go senile. But you still think about some of those same things through this completely fictional thing, this zombie that most of us know does not exist. Max Brooks uh, had a really good uh, answer. Because, of course, he gets asked all the time, why are the zombies popular? John Russo, my friend John Russo, who co-wrote Night of the Living Dead, gets asked this all the time. I, I get asked, asked this a lot, especially when talking about The Walking Dead. There was one day I was doing a radio book tour, 30 interviews in one day, and halfway through the day I was thinking, how am I going to answer this question of how, why zombies are popular again? Because I've answered it so many times today. But Max had an answer. He, he was talking about how if you watch the news or you watch something that's very very true to life in terms of 
how realistic the circumstances are. You know, say it's a film about nuclear holocaust. Well, you're going to bed, you might not be able to sleep, but you can watch something about zombies, which you know aren't real, that aren't going to, you know, arise during the night and you, you you can he said you can go to sleep some people have nightmares after that but you know we, we but it's a different kind of thing you're not touching on that for you you're not watching ebola you know the animated series because there's not going to be such a thing there's, there's no way to have fun with that and yet you can have this fun with these stories about people dying and coming back from the dead as well as stand-ins for the things that fear us that fear us <laughs> the things that we fear you know not are we losing our humanity and where is the human race going what is the end game and can there be survival recovery and rebuilding of the human race if everything falls apart and the walking dead is finally reaching the part where we're seeing the rebuilding of the world now is there a another aspect, another facet to this, where people are also drawn to shows like The Walking Dead or uh, dystopian fiction out of a hope for simplicity. In other words, a world that makes sense, where you, you kill the zombie and you try to survive, and there's a sort of simplicity there. Do you think people feel a draw to that? Definitely. If you look at something about how to fix the real world, that's complicated. There's not one nice, neat solution. And with the well, with the zombie, yeah, there is that rule: well, you shoot them in the head, they fall down. But there's even more simplicity to that. It's simplifying the world we're in. It's a bit of you know imagining a do-over. There's a lot of fiction lately about people either living in a world where they have to rebuild, or somebody actively trying to cause the world to have to have a do-over. We all oh, the Kingsman. Uh, the last Resident Evil movie where they finally got into what in the world is the Umbrella Corporation up to, aside from the, the most ridiculous business model on earth, turn your customers into zombies, uh, and a number of other stories where you see someone trying to cause the end of the world in order to have something of a rebuilding afterwards. And we don't want just any random rebuilding generally. We especially like the idea of a rebuilding where the people we like are still around. So in The Walking Dead... You know, they don't get to choose who's surviving to some extent, but they get to fight and they get to have a bit of, of a simpler life. You know, gone are their phones. Gone is the YouTube. Gone are regular jobs. There was a point when Rick, Michonne, and Carl are around the fire. And Rick commented on, you notice how many of our conversations lately just have to do with food? It, it simplified the conversation. Look at Carl. He had to immediately grow up, you know. Um, yeah. and basically jump in and start uh, killing people in zombies. Um, yeah, and Patrick O'Connor, he wrote a chapter in uh, my Walking Dead book comparing Carl kind of having to raise himself, you know, going through what we call parentification, this child who ends up taking on some of the roles of their parent. Uh, he compared Carl having to kind of raise himself to clients that O'Connor works with in our world, neglected kids who kind of have to raise themselves as well. All right, Dr. Langley, we have to go to break. When we get back, we'll get deeper into this idea of, yes, we're addicted to technology, but what happens if it suddenly shuts off? Be sure to like, subscribe, and share the video. If you'd like to support Event Horizon, you'll be pleased to know We've recently launched a Patreon, link in the description below. Or alternatively, you can use your cellular telephone to scan the assemblage of squares on screen now. And I'm back with Dr. Travis Langley, a psychologist, and we're talking about zombies and the end of the world. Now, Doctor, we were talking in the, in the previous segment about our dependence on technology and how that changes people. But, of course, it's possible that that technology can go away and say we had a Carrington-level solar flare that hit and knocks out the power grid. Say it knocks it out for months. What is would people's immediate reaction, psychologically speaking, be to the phones and everything just shutting off? Frustration. That would be the immediate reaction. We have power outages, so the immediate reaction would be frustration over it. When when power outages happen, you don't see immediate panic. 
you you see people frustrated because they're having to you know wait. So it would take a bit for people to catch on to, hey, this is really not coming back. And it would be one of degree, not the kind of immediate widespread panic a lot of people imagine. And without the instant communication to help foster fears, uh, people would not be able to get each other all riled up over the Internet about it. Now, when does the panic hit? When does the, when does the realization happen where you're saying something is seriously wrong? Is it when the pantry starts emptying, or where's that point? When you when something kicks into affecting actual survival, that is when you see the greatest likelihood of panic kicking in. In fact, people with a lot of anxiety disorders, panic disorders, and so forth, what seems to be going on with many of them is they've got these brains that evolved for dangerous situations and for dangerous worlds. And even though they are not in the situations where those kind of dangers still exist, we still have that stuff in our brains. We have, you know, in the amygdala and the hypothalamus and some other areas, we have things that are ready to look for signs of threat, signs of danger. And for some people they get magnified into perceiving into, into perceiving things as unrealistic threats, into panicking. The things that threaten our survival, that is when panic becomes more likely. It, it still, it tends to need to be abrupt, chaotic, and where there is just enough of a sense of control that you think you have to be doing something. When people feel completely helpless, they don't tend to panic. They get depressed and kind of lifeless. Like uh, the prisoners of Nazi concentration camps. They weren't panicking. They got worked in there bit by bit, degree by degree, like that frog that supposedly will sit in the hot water until it dies, even though they don't really act that way. And they were worked into it by degrees and you didn't see the mass panics among individuals who were dying by the millions. Likewise, in the real world, it takes somebody else panicking to set it off. When resources are threatened, that's when you see uh, these things happen the most. Now, in The Walking Dead, um, when it begins, we, we see these sorts of reactions, but eventually factions pop up. You know, it starts with families. People try to keep their families together. Then people congregate. And then eventually you have these factions, like the the saviors or something like that, where they fight and infight. Is that realistic? Um, would people factionalize like that and start fighting over those resources, or would it be more ordered? Um, would it would it depend on the leadership? How how would that play out? Is, is the Walking Dead realistic scenario in that in that event? World history suggests factions pretty strongly. We we tend to group together. We have this impulse to divide people into us or them you know we we other as a verb we other other people too easily at times especially when our resources are threatened and people cluster together we are social people we pull together with others it t it tends to take somebody at the higher level to help people think a, re a very strong le leader can possibly help pull a lot of individuals together but even with them they tend to have factions within your groups within groups subgroups we have a strong tendency to cluster and to divide ourselves between us and them whether the division is based on race circumstances they even studies showing as something as simple as divide your research participants randomly into those wearing red shirts those wearing blue shirts with no other difference between them and there's still a tendency to start thinking of us and them just over the damn shirts now us versus them mm -hmm. to, to to bring that back to psychology or back to technology rather now we have this concept of an uncanny valley where technology can become so close to human that it becomes um, spooky. It creeps people out. Um, and I, I, maybe that could be said for a zombie. It's almost human. Um, you know. Actually, I, I talked about I talk about that uh, early in the book. In fact, and while the uncanny valley that Maury observed years ago, he was originally talking about robots as they're getting close. As, as robots become more and more human-like, there's a point at which it's just creepy. You know, when you have you know, the sex bot who doesn't quite look fully human but doesn't look fully like a toy either, that unnerves people and doesn't have to be the sex bot. And, and zombies are, man, they are right there deep in the uncanny valley. The, the, people are 
bothered by corpses. Well, corpses are human beings who are, you know, were human beings but aren't anymore. And they're even more bothered by moving corpses. It's an industrial robot, you don't have particularly strong feelings about it. It's, it's just this machine. A more human-like robot, we become more comfortable with until it gets so close to human that it's almost there, but not quite there. And that we find particularly creepy and unnerving. The Uncanny Valley is not quite as universal as a, lot, as a lot of people talk like it is, but there are some very strong tendencies. You see them with, with toys. Uh, say a stuffed animal, a, a little plush bear. It's like a, a little plush bear that looks like a real bear, a certain level of comfort. It, it gets a little cuter, more human-like, more like a human infant generally when they get with the bigger eyes and the cuter shapes. And then when it gets to say a bear with even more human features, like a bear with truly human eyes and mouth, that's a creepy sounding monster. And so the zombies are right there deep in that uncanny valley. Now, the um, the Uncanny Valley leads to another thing you actually mentioned in that was uh, Maslow's hi hierarchy, where yep. you go up different stages to achieve human um, completeness, I suppose you would say. Can you explain that? Well, Abraham Maslow, building from what some other uh, psychologists have talked about, he came up with this idea that we have this hierarchy of needs that we have to progress through in order to reach our potential as human beings. And while there are all kinds of things that contradict him, it's like you can go back, back and forth in these. You can work on different levels at the same time. And his idea of self-actualization was shaped heavily by who Maslow admired. Regardless of all that, there are still some aspects that are ring true. There the reason people keep talking about Maslow's hierarchy of needs is because there is something true to human experience in there. So he, he would draw it as this pyramid at the very bottom, the most basic physiological needs, where you have to have them met in order to work on higher needs. If you are starving, you're not exactly going to choose a philosophical conversation over a piece of bread. You've got to have those basic physiological needs met in order to work on higher needs. You know, above that, your know, safety needs. If you're, even if you're not starving right now, you, know, you need a roof over your head. Or, you know, if you're starving and don't have a roof on your head, then it's hard to feel loved, hard to feel self-esteem. If you don't have self-esteem, then you're know, hard to work your way you know, on up through this level of needs that he was talking about. And so what we were talking about before about the panic, when the panic sets in, when those most basic survival needs are threatened, that's down there at the most basic part of the pyramid, the immediate needs. You're starving, you desperately want that food for you and your family. You have now been displaced from your home. You're gonna fight other people for space so you'll feel safe. When those needs are threatened, we can even you know, lose and forget some of the higher parts of ourselves. Uh, Victor Frankl, Holocaust survivor, he talked about how you know during their times in the camps, the best people weren't the ones who survived. You know, the ones who survived had something a little more cynical about them. And, but in the long run, an awful lot of who survived and who did not was random. And they thought about survival needs. They thought about their hunger. They early on might have spent more time in some philosophical conversations or a discussion of something, of, oh, I missed the art. And later on, it is about that, it's just about that day's existence and are you going to live today or are you going to die? So many of the more advanced things, the more complicated qualities of human beings were turned off for a while. You know, Victor Frankl himself, it, it, prominent psychologist. I mean, he went on to talk about man's search for meaning, as he called it. You'd call it a sexist title now, but that, he was talking about human beings in general, about how we search for meaning for the things that we go through in order to justify having gone through them. But these these parts were these, these fear of ourselves being turned off. You you see that in some of the people who refer to as, psych, as sociopaths. Psychopaths, they kind of didn't have it to begin with. Sociopaths, people who had a conscience, had the potential to be, you know, good, empathetic human beings, but circumstances have just shut off and seem to have killed that part of themselves. In The Walking Dead, they address these things where, you know, Shane, who's Rick's best friend, and he becomes so focused on survival needs and, and 
the, the few people that he wants to cling to and protect, that he will endanger everybody else. There's, there was nothing to indicate that this was somebody who'd been you know, a monster before, and then he does monstrous things. And Frankel talked about how there were individuals in the camps who, at times, they were doing terrible things, you know, stealing somebody else's bread. This is going to be a perfectly good person who you would have been generous throughout their lives. And then they're stealing somebody else's bread because those deep survival needs have kicked in and kind of shut off these, these so-called higher functions. Now, to get back to the Uncanny Valley and this idea of, of zombies being too close to human. Well, that it, of course, that can happen to us in the real world with technology and robots. But there's another way it could happen. Say scientists looking at SETI the search for extraterrestrial intelligence with radio telescopes. Say they found a signal, and all of a sudden, we we have this unknown. We see a signal, and we believe it's of technological origin, and it's from out there. What, what, how would people react to that? Would they react the same way um, they would to zombies? Would we fear them? Um, because we're going to know next to nothing about them, presumably. Or would it be something that people are like, well, they're just so distant, they, there's no threat? Or what is what is the psychology of that? Uh, of course, to some extent, we're just speculating. You can look a little bit at history. Look at when people have encountered individuals of other races and cultures they've never seen before. You know, Native Americans who see Columbus and you know his kind arrive, and some saw them as threats. More saw them as curiosity and allowed them to get, get in. Although we can also look at, okay, well, that didn't work out very well for them in the long run. But even though there were those who saw them as threats, more were curious and more were willing to see, okay, what will these others do and give them the chance? And I think for those, of course, there will be those who will be afraid. There will be those who will you know, think, oh, we can blow these aliens out of the sky, while others go, like, they're able to reach us from space. They're more advanced than us. They'll probably laugh at our attempt to blow them out of the sky, like in Independence Day when you know the Americans nuke Houston. And so, but more people, they'll be curious. They'll people want to know that there is something more. People want there to be something fantastic in the universe, whether the aliens exist or not. Our interest in them alone why do we keep talking about them why do so many people believe in them why do so many people who don't believe in them still keep talking about them we're intrigued by these ideas just the fact that we make up so many stories or that we're so interested in the accounts of those who say they've seen them that interest alone says people are going to be more curious than afraid but that says that you know, there's a, a message that there, there's no content. Say they, they see an alien radar and there's no message there. But if you did detect a message and you could decode it, which is probably pretty unlikely that you could, but if, if you could, say it's something bad, like the old uh, trope, um, the first SETI message, first SETI message is, is, is that, you know, an alien civilization telling us, be quiet or they'll hear you. Does that change it? Does it become a thing of fear at that point? A lot of people are ready to feel it feel fear and there are those who are you know willing to foster it there are political elections that have been won by fear uh, there, there are also those that have been won by hope but they a lot of anger anger is easier to work up fear is easier to work up you know, this this bit about the dark side being easier in Star Wars not necessarily better not necessarily more powerful but easier and there will be those who will prey on it and as long as our as long as our internet is still on we're able to feed each other in ways that some of these might have just died out if there weren't people around there it's like even if nobody around you is panicking you can go on the internet and find somebody who's panicking about that kind of thing to help reinforce your fear now another thing you covered and i found this really interesting you covered with this book is you actually got into the neuroscience of if you could have a zombie, you know, just just saying that if you could have one, what would be intact? You know, what based on its behavior, what parts of the brain would be involved in doing what it does? So where does this start? You know, um, what dies in a zombie and what stays alive as far as their brain goes to allow them to function? 
Yeah, this is where we get, if we're looking at real science, it's where we end up just not leaving room for zombies to exist. If you know how quickly the brain just starts deteriorating after death, you're not going to see room for it to be reactivated three days later if it was genuinely dead. But from the actions that you see the zombies engage in, you can speculate. You know, it's like, it looks like the cerebellum's thrown off the, with the lurching gates and all, the movement that's not completely coordinated anymore, such as somebody who has a head if somebody has a head injury that injures the cerebellum, they walk differently because they've lost some of that, you know, immediate um, coordination and motion and the things that are well learned. The one thing I remember even back in um, Romero's Day of the Dead. He had a scientist character look at how it's like, you know, here it is, we've got this activity, you know, in the hypothalamus that's driving them to want to eat. You know, the, the hunger drive and the amygdala, you know, the amygdala is connecting our motivations to what's setting them off. And they, the hunger itself has more to do with the hypothalamus. And so these parts of the brains seem to be active somehow. And even in that diagram that we saw in the episode at the end of season one of The Walking Dead, where you look at the brain scan, he seems like hey, most of the brain is just dead. Most of the brain's not active. The higher functions are gone. Although it looked more dead than it should for something that's moving. There should have been some uh, a little additional movement in areas having to do with the motion of the body and some physical senses. Those zombies have some physical senses. And they sh one of the things is it, 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 I keep looking at how they will talk about how well it seems to be if you make yourself smell like a zombie, uh, they'll they'll think you're a walker. They'll think you're a walker if you cover yourself in the guts. It must be the smell. And I had a I actually Walking Dead is the only comic book I've had letters published in its letter column, and I had an, an early one. Uh, to uh, Kirkman, in which uh, I commented about how this uh, seems to have more to do with the actions because the olfactory bulb is so easily damaged. We so easily lose our sense of smell that, neurologically speaking, it's incredibly unlikely that the smell would be what they're going by uh, and their vision is weak, but something's functioning. Even though if you're dead, it shouldn't be. There, you don't have the frontal cortex judgment decision making going on when they're fooled by stimuli. It's that you're setting off a different reflexive kind of action. They're going after living things to eat them, but they'll be attracted by things that are connected with those. Like sounds will attract them, so they're obviously able to hear. You have some sort of functioning in the temporal lobe, the parts that are processing those sounds. You, they're they are moving their bodies. So there has to be some spinal uh, cord functioning. Although they're not, they're not feeling pain, so either those nerves aren't working, or the parts of brain, parts of the brain that care about the brain aren't working. So we get all these different parts of the brain. We can speculate what's working, what's not. The higher functioning is the part you think of as the cerebral cortex, especially the frontal cortex, does not seem to be active. Or you'd have more signs of zombies learning or showing other responses other than simple reflexes but they don't appear to be learning anything or else they would you would see evidence of that yeah not in the walking dead in romero's move in romero's land of the dead uh, he showed that the zombies were learning and robert kirkman commented about that about that being one that established a clear difference between Romero's zombies and Kirkman's zombies. Kirkman said, well, you know, George's zombies might learn. Mine don't. Their brains just rot. Interesting. Now, you said something that piqued my interest. Now, you say that the olfactory bulb, the sense of smell, is really easy to damage. Mm -hmm. um, is that yep. during the process of death, you know, your senses are obviously shut down. Is that among the first, I guess? Um, mm -hmm. I've also heard that hearing is among the last. Why is that? Okay, the amount of brain, the number of nerves, the location, the type of nerves, uh, the olfactory sense. Oh, for example, my son, Alex, uh, he lost a sense of smell for 10 years. And one day it abruptly came back. And the doctor said what that appeared to mean was that he'd had a pinched nerve. The, the nerve input to the olfactory bulb was simply pinched, and that kept him from having a sense of smell for 10 years. And then it was unpinched, and he could smell. 
And it was that. So, so it's also think, imagine that whatever had been pinched, if it had actually been rotting even just a little bit before some something's going through reanimating things like well you know even if there's something to make the body move those cells have been impaired there's the olfactory bulb in the human being is a tiny little part on the underside of the brain it, it, relative to uh, other creatures especially other mammals and birds uh, we have an incredibly tiny portion of the brain that is olfactory bulb the animals that can smell better and distinguish things by smell have a larger part of their brain that is olfactory bulb vultures they have a lot of olfactory bulb the t-rex well, we know looking at their brain pans it appears to have had a huge olfactory bulb which is one of the arguments some make to say that they were scavengers so they have more brain devoted to interpreting what they can smell and ultimately, it's the brain that does these things. Your nose does not smell. It's any more than a camera is seeing. The nose is simply relaying input into the part that ultimately does the smelling, which is there in the olfactory bulb. The parts of the brain devoted to hearing, they're, there's, they're not as fragile as, say, the system involved in vision. Um, and... The olfact and the vision is not as fragile as that which is involved in smell. And it's the amount of brain that's associated with each as well and their locations. And have an advantage with hearing in that it's also on opposite sides of the brain. The right side of the brain hears what comes to the left ear and vice versa. You know, a strike across the back of the head could get the occipital lobe, the visual area, for both sides all at once. So there are a lot of different reasons why hearing will endure in ways even beyond vision you know it's like it's like when you stop hearing when you're in old age you're having more trouble hearing if we deliver an electrical charge to the hearing part of the brain the person can they'll hear something it's just the the information is not getting in there as well as it used to thank you doctor it was a wonderful conversation i hope you'll come back and uh visit us again sometime and um best of luck with uh both you and your son's book no thank you I, i've enjoyed this we fear the unrealistic if it's put to us in just such a way, such as a zombie film or Dracula. But we fear them for very good reasons, rooted deeply in psychology. But the ultimate fear is that our world could end. And, as it does, the carnage unleashed by that would be unpredictable, if not unimaginable. Characters in television series like The Walking Dead show us a glimpse of a world like that and the psychology of those trapped within it. We see characters like Negan, who try to cope with the death of his wife by filling that void with a barbed wire bat that he talks to as though it were her and cares more for it than life itself. Or how about Rick, who finds himself in a position of leadership during bleak scenario after bleak scenario, expected by all to maintain his composure? What of having children in such a world? Thankfully, zombie apocalypses are something we imagine, a kind of stand-in for things that actually could end the world. Next week, I'll be joined by astrophysicist Adam Frank for a discussion of the Drake Equation, Astrobiology, and the Possibilities of Life for the Universe. See you then, and happy Halloween. Anna, is that you? Is what, me? That noise. Maybe. Is it bothering you? It's cheesy, stop it. I'm being spooky, John. You're going to have to try harder if you're going to scare... <laughs> And how was that? It was... better. <laughs>